five elements are at the core of most esoteric practices. One of the reasons that's so is because it's considered that the five elements is what the body is made of. And of course, it's also what the body disintegrates into once you die. So it's the most uh, basic lawful cycle um, that's been determined you know, many, many, many thousand years ago and in many different traditions. So earth is the first one. Water is the next one. Fire. Air. And ether. And ether in some traditions is called void or space as well. We'll go into that. So I essentially came into these practices before even my um, lineage teacher because the first woman I ever studied with was a woman named Magdalena who was kind of an herb witch. And uh, Magdalena's whole... um, uh, exploration as well as business and you know I'm saying business very lightly because she wasn't you know it wasn't an official business but everybody knew that if you needed lotions or potions or remedies Magdalena was the woman to go to and she she knew everything about herbs she knew everything about where to find them how to pick them when in the moon cycle to pick them how to you know to to uh, process them what to do with it rituals she's still alive well at last i know she's still alive uh october was the last time i saw her i saw her a few times last year because i knew she was very old and i really wanted to kind of um go back and see her and i also once again had one of those insane colds and she has these uh, steam sauna things in her house. I have to actually find it for you. I, I will find it for you. She lives in this old farmhouse. And um, God, I wish I could find this quickly. Uh, and in Austria, in the old farmhouses, above the door is usually an alcove where they have um, either a, a Catholic saint or Jesus or Mary. And uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's like in all alpine areas they have that and so above her house in her alcove is a highly pregnant woman but like from the you know like like it looked like looks medieval she's just she's like one um, hand below her belly and one hand above her belly and she just looks out and that that's her home deity um yeah she's a very cool woman and um she's in her later 90s, I think 96 or 97. So she started me on the elements. And then, of course, in my lineage, as it is in all shamanic and tantric traditions, uh, the elements are essential, right? The elements are the basis of of all shamanic traditions, uh, of all tantric, uh, female tantric traditions. They are also, and some of you know this, Larissa knows this, right? In all Vajrayana traditions, but particularly uh, in that tradition, uh, the elements are a very, very big part. And one of the reasons why in the Tibetan Vajrayana traditions it's a very big part is that um, the Tibetans essentially took the native earlier religions, which is called burn, and integrated them into the Tibetan uh, practices as they are done. And they are all uh, shamanic elemental practices uh, with a lot of dancing and movement and rituals and so you'll find it in the Tibetan traditions very strongly. Most people in the West have heard about these things via Chogyam Trumpa, who was a you know very um, big and very controversial uh, Tibetan teacher because he introduced the the, the families, the, the elemental families into his teachings and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. The story of how the Tibetans integrated the bone uh, bone tradition is quite interesting, actually. We can learn a little bit of something from that story, how that happened. There was a king in Tibet who was very interested in Buddhism, 
and he wanted to have it established in Tibet. So he sent for the abbot of the sort of big, like Harvard or something of Buddhism, you know, the, one of the big monastic colleges in India, which was later destroyed. Anyway, he came to Tibet, and he was beginning to sort of establish Buddhism there, and they were beginning to build a, a temple, a sort of a monastery. The, the, the story is that the wrathful deities, all the sort of spirits of the land, bear in mind this is folk religion of Bone, right? They're spirits of the land, the guardian spirits, and all their kind of pantheon of um, personified forces would tear the work they'd done in the temple down each night. So they'd get a little bit of it done, and then they'd go to sleep, and they wake up, and all the wrathful deities and all the you know, sort of spirits and so on, ghosts and stuff, came and destroyed what they'd done. So it was pretty annoying, you know, um, even for a Buddhist. So this guy was like, I can't, uh, the abbot, I can't, um, don't have really the power or the, the, the wherewithal to deal with this. But I know a guy. I know a guy. So he called uh, for Padma Sambhava, who was allegedly born from a lotus in the middle of a lake. We don't, don't worry about that. That's why they call him Padma Sambhava, because Padma, is up there? It actually means lotus, is, is uh, what it means in Sanskrit. So Padma Sambhava came, right? And he was sort of a magician of Tantra. He was so good at all of the energies and so enlightened in such an amazing way. So he came and he converted. He, he didn't destroy or drive out these uh, guardian spirits and uh, people like that. He actually converted them. He submitted them and recruited them as protectors of the Dharma, which is what they call the Buddhist kind of religion, right? He, he made them protectors of, their, of the faith, recruited them to be kind of like henchmen of Buddhism in a way, right? Protecting it sort of from things going wrong. That's the story. So it depends. You can look at it different ways. Either he went in there with his magical powers and actually did that, we could look at it another way, that this Pabas and Baba fellow recast those characters, which were so central to the Tibetan culture, he recast them in uh, a new context. He, just like in uh, Christianity, they took a lot of the old pagan things, like Christmas and Easter, um, and recast them in a kind of Christian context, so people didn't have to completely abandon their cultural uh, identity in order to join this new religion. Interesting. It's quite common, actually, in the Jesuits, when they were in, went to China, uh, their, China didn't really get converted to Christianity very successfully, though the, the Jesuits and the Dominicans were sort of the um, very um, uh, missionary-based priests. And, you know, um, there's that Scorsese movie that just came out, Silence, about Jesuits in Japan. Did you guys see that? Liam Neeson's in it. He has a very particular set of skills. Okay. Um, it's all about the Jesuits in Japan. Right? Very interesting. And the Jesuits and the Dominicans had a falling out about how to convert the Chinese because the Chinese culture was very heavily interested in ancestor worship. And the Jesuits said, yeah, I mean, in the Bible it says, honor your father and mother. So we could sort of recast this as a sort of an honoring of father and mother, you know, an honoring of the family line. It's not that heretical. Because the Jesuits, who were pretty smart, didn't think that it would be possible to get the Chinese out of the ancestor worship thing. So they thought, well, let's see if we can recast it like Padmas and Baba did, right? Well, they didn't know about him, but, you know, same sort of idea. If we could recast the ancestor worship in a Christian light, and then people will be able to take their cultural underpinning, which is so foundational in Chinese culture in those days, with, with them to the new religion. Um, and the Dominicans said, no, it's heretical. It's bad, you know, it's sort of idolatry. Worshipping of ancestors is like idolatry. They decided to see it that way. And there was, they had a debate about it and a fight about it. It went back to the Vatican. The Vatican said, no, we'll go with the Dominican way. Tell them it's wrong. Tell them they have to abandon it, their ancestor worship practice. For China to convert to Christianity, it would have had to have essentially stopped being Chinese in a very fundamental cultural fashion. And as a consequence of that, um, and other reasons, but that's uh, one way of looking at it. As a consequence of that, the Christianity never really took hold in China to the degree it did other uh, countries in the region. So when we look at things like these elements and stuff like that, 
and we say, well, the, the body is made of these elements and, and, and things. You don't have to adopt at so literal level these ideas as a sort of way of a belief or something like that. You don't have to do that. You can understand that these are observations and systems that have applications from certain cultural contexts and you can translate them into your own cultural context. You don't have to uh, abandon reason, for instance, or science. You can begin to integrate them and translate them, much like Padmasambhava did with the wrathful deities and so on in Tibet. Playing with them almost as lenses, ways of looking at it. You engage in it fully, mythically, without necessarily compromising your core values as a, as a modern person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The elements exist in all traditions. They certainly exist very strongly in the Chinese traditions, right? in the Hindu traditions. Um, they also exist, and this is where you got started, um, in the Western uh, traditions, where um, when you look at you know, Paracelsus and, and, and so medieval doctors, it was all about the elements. It was all about, oh, uh, this person has too much water, so that's why their lungs are wet. And, you know, they, they did it all via the elements. Later that became, and also, as you know, uh, alchemy, right? It's all about um, working with the elements and other, you know, elementals. And so all the traditions carry that elemental practice because it is so native and so deeply in our bodies and in our uh, cultural and and hereditary psyche. So you can slice it every which way, um, and we will slice it a few different ways just for the enjoyment of it, but we're just giving you an um, overview here. And uh, certainly Magdalena, who and, and Deepa, my, you know, my main teacher, both had very strong ideas around um, the elements as a way to feel your body, work with your body, sexual practice in the body, all of those kind of things. And of course, uh, in Austria, Austria, that part of Austria was very Celtic and is till this day, when you look at Rudolf Steiner, for instance, I don't know if you know about Rudolf Steiner, those are all biodynamic Celtic practices that he's essentially just made into whatever he made them into. But they don't come from him. He's just taken them because Rudolf Steiner actually comes from the same town I was born in. And uh, that's, you, you, that's just what you do till this day. People don't question that. And the Catholics just took it uh, as much as they could so that it wasn't quite so fringe, um, f- you know, fringy in where they could. And so Magdalena had essentially a Celtic herb lore practice, but there was a lot of kind of pseudo-Catholic, Celtic ritual in there. Like, you'd go get hazel sticks, and then you'd gather these seven different, um, this is coming up, that's why I'm thinking about it, you'd gather these seven different trees, and you create this kind of broom-looking bush, and on Easter, which is typically, uh, you know, on a, on a moon, um, spot, you go and you put that uh, stick, you bless it, and you know you put it in the fields, and then that does a certain thing to the fertility. Of course, the Catholics couldn't have any of that, because that also came, of course, with people having sex in the fields. So they, they just uh, took those things and had them blessed by the local priest, and uh, they did um, you know, um, the dancing that comes before the fucking in the fields and made it into the maypole dancing. So they've kind of cleaned it all up, but the, ori- the origins of all of that, how you combine the elements for fertility, how do you combine the elements for um, purification, you know, all of that, that was long before then. So we're going to go into um, the very basic shamanic uh, engagement of your body with the elements that's, of course, in your body. So because... We're looking at this through the lens of my lineage. I'm going to give you the tantric terms just for the fun of it. So earth is a bhumi, B-H-U-M-I. Bhuvaneshwari comes from the same root. Somebody here probably had bhuvaneshwari. No, maybe you haven't. You? Ellen had, Ellen had bhuvaneshwari. Yeah? So bhu is always the, the ground. And... Uh, uh, so Bhumi is earth. Um, Eka Bhumi, you sometimes see, is uh, the good earth, like the fertile earth. 
um, then water is APA, A-P-A, or JALA, J-A-L-A. There's always several terms, but APA or JALA, you sometimes see that. And then, as you said, fire is AGNI, A-G-N-I, or TEAS. Sometimes they say TEAS, and sometimes they say TEAS, which is T-E-J-A-S. TEAS is what you sometimes hear in yoga, the purification, the, the, the fires. And then air is vayu, V-A-Y-U, and vayu, of course, also means wind in Sanskrit. So it's the, the moving, you know, wind, wind or va- air, vayu. And then this one, you know, the ether, the ether void space, shunya, shunya, or akash, A-K-A-S-H. So those are the, those are the tantric names. And then there's something quite fun about this because the five elements connect with the five senses. So it is considered that earth uh, engages all five senses. So the five senses are hear, see, feel. Smell and taste. So earth you can hear, see, feel, smell, and taste. Water, you can hear, see, feel, and taste. Nowadays, of course, right, you can also smell water, but back then water was so pure you wouldn't smell it, meaning you can smell water if there's chlorine in it or, you know, things like that. But for the sake of this exploration... It's considered that water you has four of them. Fire, guess what? Hear, see, feel. That's right. Air, hear, and feel. Now you could argue that you could smell fire from the smoke, but that's not the actual fire, right? So it's here, see, feel for fire, and it's here and feel on air. And then ether is considered that you can only hear. Now, ether, of course, is kind of an interesting element because it's not a tangible element, but ether in all traditions is con- considered, and this is very beautiful, actually, it's considered the um, origin of sound, And the reason ether is considered the origin of sound is that ether is considered the material or the substance that is everywhere where there's nothing else. So it's kind of the glue between things. It's the empty space between everything, in your organs, in this room, so to speak, uh, out there and in the universe. So everywhere there isn't matter, there's ether, they say. And so that is why ether is considered the origin of sound because it's considered that the, the primal or, or primordial sound comes from the space in the, that is the emptiness of the universe. You sometimes hear that. And now, of course, they have recorded that sound. Uh, you, you know, there's, there's a certain sound that space makes. They've now picked that up. It's very, very beautiful. So... In the, in the um, Hindu and Tantric uh, traditions, ether is considered the origin of jap, japa, J-A-A-P-A or J-A-A-P, um, or nad. So jap or nad, N-A-A-D. And jap or nad is uh, um, the science of using sounds and words to open the channels of the body for devotion, as well as yoga. <clears throat> Which is a very, very big uh, part of the, um, you know, the final outcome of deity yoga, which is what they call the great marriage or the, you know, sacred marriage. Where sound, particularly sound through the central channel, is a big part of that uh, tantric union. So that's how it plays out. So the senses get reduced as you go through the um, elements.
The elements and, and with that, and particularly Nad or Jap yoga, Japa, uh, the, the chanting and the sounds and the way the tongue hits the upper palate is one of the practices that you do to, in the elemental practices for the tantric union. In the sexual practice, in the preliminaries of the sexual practice, there's 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 all the elements, right? There's the grounding. There is uh, what what the water means, which is a cohesion. Um, there is the fire, which is the kind of passion or friction, heat. The air, which is an expansion, and then the ether, which is the void. Right? And in the void, there is sound. So you know, uh, of course. These senses and, and elements are used in Ayurveda. You see that a lot. You know, particularly, you always hear people talk about vata derangements, which is when you get really dizzy and up, right? which is too much air, or overheating, which is too much fire. So uh, also in Chinese medicine, the same thing. The elements is how you deal with imbalances in the body. Of course... Uh, each of these elements has kind of a shadow side, a plus and a, you know, like a positive application and a negative application. The positive uh, application of earth, which is what we're working with today, is of course grounding, and there's more to that, but I'm just going to say grounding. And the shadow side or negative side of earth is inertia. Can't get your ass off the ground. Right, that's the that's the negative side. We'll work with both of those today. The um, water positive side is cohesion. The shadow side is disbursement. Right, being dispersed, you know, flopping all over the place, like a, a dam that breaks, and or even if you spill a, you know water on the floor, it goes everywhere. That's the shadow side of water. Fire, the positive aspect is energy, lots of energy. The negative aspect, it can be, you know, heat is not always a negative aspect, but it can be a negative aspect, heat, and then destruction, of course. And then air, the positive aspect is expansion. And the negative aspect is disembodiment. And then ether, since it's void and all empty or all full, doesn't have positive, negative. At that. So the last thing, because that's something interesting, if you are interested in it, and you, it is by no means something that you need to uh, consider, but if you are... Um, you know, having some available space to kind of explore this. In the Buddhist traditions, and Chogyam Trumper particularly called it the five wisdom families. It's a great book out there, which I can um, send you the link to as well. So the five wisdom families, where essentially there's a whole typology. You know, like everybody likes to typecast people. In, in, you know, in, in something that you can feel yourself, it doesn't matter if it's astrology or if you're an intuitive empath or you know, Myers-Briggs or what, whatever. There's, everybody has some way of saying it. The, the Enneagram, um, the Buddhists have, the, the Vajrayana Buddhists have this, and it's called the Five Wisdom Families, which is a whole way of um, looking at yourself through the lens of these elements. And so the first one is Ratna, R-A-T-N-A. -A. So the Ratna family is earth, and it's associated with the color yellow. Vajra, V-A-G-R-A, -A, for those of you who are making notes. J-R-A. J-R-A, yeah. Um, that's water, and the color is white. Padma, as Steve mentioned earlier, Padma Sambhava was considered born from a lotus because Padma means lotus. So Padma is fire and it's red.
And then there's karma. Which is air and it's green. And Buddha. Which is ether and it's blue. And then because you were asking about the Ratna. Um, Ratna has the jewel as his family symbol. Padma has the lotus as a family symbol. Karma has a, a double Vajra or sword as a symbol. Vajra has the Vajra, you know what the Vajra looks like uh, as a symbol. And Buddha has the eight-spoked wheel as a symbol. And so they go into fine details, like what you like to wear, what kind of art you like, how you like to practice, what you're about. I mean, they're, they're like really, really detailed. It's quite fascinating. Um, the poisons of these, just because we're doing that, is the Buddha, the Buddha poison is delusion or ignorance. <laughs> the Vajra is anger. The poison is anger. Ratna, pride. Padma, desire. And, and karma is jealousy. And then they have, you know, like the scandals and the, I mean, there's like endless uh, things. But so you can pretty much probably uh, um, find yourself in there if you want to go in there a little bit. Like, for instance, I'm Ratna. Um, and Steve, you can guess who, what Steve is. They come with uh, very specific um, qualities. It's very fascinating. And, it's, uh, and then they, of course, go into how do you practice within your family. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it goes endless down to how do you decorate your shrine room? What do you wear? <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite fun. Everything comes from the earth and everything returns to the earth. The earth is, of course, the primal element um, in which all women um, are well-versed because it's where things are born and where things die. So it's considered the nurturing, nourishing, fertile part of each human and of course particularly of each woman since you are birthing you and I me not actively but birthing things you know from our body um, in this case humans but you can also birth other things from your body and the earth of course um, very much like our body in certain ways will give regardless of well, to a certain degree, regardless of how abused or neglected uh, the earth is, because the earth is built as the thing that, from which you know, everything comes. So, like for instance, um, my front field at my little farm has been under drought for like five years, and there hasn't been a shred of anything. It's just dust. Right? And this year we had very, very strong rains, and within three or four days it was green. And, and, and the, I mean, where the hell that green came from, no, you know, you can't even, you don't even know. But that's the earth, right? When given, when given uh, the chance, the earth will produce. No ifs, whens, and buts. So the earth is also the sign or the element that speaks of abundance, of generosity. It's the basis of all sexual exploration because your sexual exploration comes through the base of your body. So the earth never forgets. Right? Earth never forgets. Meaning anything that has ever happened in the earth is deposited there 
in layers upon layer upon layer. So the way that um, ancient civilizations are being dated um, is they just dig down and they analyze the carbon in whatever layer they're in because you can tell because it doesn't get lost. Right? So the earth, the earth never forgets. It's very good and it can be very bad at times. So that's what we're working with uh, primarily today and the general grounding. And so um, earth practice is the landing in one's own fertile soil, so to speak. Like for instance, water forgets. Right, that's the whole idea with water. Water moves, it cleanses itself. So, but earth never forgets. And that's um, because we're going into pleasure practice in, in this round, that's an essential aspect of this, this, asp this whole exploration. Because in pleasure practice is that you are able to sustain yourself and sustain practice beyond... Uh, the boredom or the inertia, um, and of course, start a practice right in the in the first place, but then sustain the practice beyond when it 's comfortable because you 're a little bit tired or you want to move faster, but you need to conserve your energy so that you have equal output for long periods of time, or it 's time to exhaust yourself and not hold back right All of those um, considerations are directly related to pleasure sexual practice.